like and subscribe. The committee's meeting on its study of the Canada People's Republic of China relations with a focus on the Asian Infrastructure Bank. So our first panel now, we'd like to uh, welcome Mr. Bob Picard as an individual and, uh, and allegedly no stranger to these precincts, uh, precincts including this building, but uh, we'll leave that explanation for another time. Uh, Mr. Picard, you have up to five minutes to deliver your opening remarks. Let me thank the chair and all members for welcoming me here today to communicate what happened with my experience at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which was a traumatic, dramatic, and in my case, it was a very, very uh, patriotic moment because I felt that our membership in this organization uh, was not giving this country a single thing of tangible value that we could uh, proudly explain to people here in our country that their membership in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank would be, would be delivering them back home. Since Xi Jinping proposed the AIIB in 2013, AIIB, it never became well-known globally. And what public awareness it did have, it was often tainted by a perceived association with the controversial and increasingly aggressive geopolitical policies of the People's Republic of China, especially the Belt and Road Initiative. It was in this context that I was approached to help build a profile and to shape a positive public image for AIIB. I was asked to join as the bank's global communications chief in late 2021, not long after the two Michaels were released. Having previously, having previously served in senior capacities at public relations firms such as Edelman and Burson Marsteller, with 16 years of Asia-Pacific experience, I was well-placed to help AIIB communicate its story. But before signing on, I had some concerns about whether the PRC government was exercising undue influence at the bank. Now, AIIB's published governance, it did allay these concerns somewhat, and I was reassured by the presence of Western countries on the shareholders list, including, of course, my my own country, our country, Canada. It didn't take me long, though, to realize after joining the bank that the reality of power inside of AIIB does not match the rhetoric. And to see how respected G7 countries like Canada, with a reputation, were brandished like trophy members to help attract Western capital and to avoid hostile policy consequences from U.S. authorities in Washington. Inside of the bank, CCP members wield power in many of the most important positions from the top down. Mr. Jin, the president of the bank, himself a, a staunch CCP member and former Red Guard, often articulates Chinese government policy as if it were his own. As the bank's spokesperson, I advised him that he should communicate his views as the leader of a multilateral organization and refrain from parroting the PRC government's point of view. Now, even though I was supposedly in charge of all global communications for the bank, I subsequently discovered that Mr. Jin's office, dominated by Communist Party members, was directly involved in crafting messaging with PRC media for the domestic Chinese market that differed from what the bank was communicating in English to overseas audiences. Now, devising public messaging to distinguish AIIB from the controversial BRI, which of course is Xi Jinping's signature number one most important geopolitical expansion project. It was seen as a critical priority and that was requested of me directly by President Jin. And yet privately, these two PRC initiatives seemed uncomfortably more intertwined and interrelated than I had been led to believe. In my own department, a CCP member just, just imagine this, was appointed as my personal assistant. I found out that this Communist Party member appointed as my assistant was secretly reporting directly to the most senior party member in Mr. Jin's office. This arrangement, to say the least, was outside of the bank's supposed reporting lines. So I had an in-house snitch reporting directly to Communist Party members what was going on. Every journalist I met with, every civil society leader I met with. So, interestingly, in 
2022, I'd been there for a number of months at this point, the, the Communist Party presence in the president's office at AIIB, it was bolstered by the arrival of a new colleague whose job description nobody seemed to know except that he was supposed to be the new party guy. Within a few months, Mr. Jin's office suite underwent a remodeling. Security locks were installed, controlling the access of all AIIB staff. The bank's vice president, none of them Chinese, needed to be buzzed into his office for the very first time, and that created a lot of resentment internally. This cocooning of the AIIB president is consistent with how the information he receives and the issues he decides are filtered through two CCP officials whose offices were close, closest physically to his inside of this bubble. Now, at the AIIB, almost nothing Mr. Jin, the president, sees, says, or does happens without the deep involvement of these two Communist Party officials. And how do I know this? I know this because the communications department for which I was responsible was located right next to Mr. Jin's office. Now, Mr. Picard, your five minutes has expired. Uh, I'm sure you have more to say, and perhaps you can work that into answers to some of the questions that you'll be receiving. Mr. Seebach, the uh, first six minutes are yours. Uh, Mr. Picard, I'm actually going to suggest that you continue where you were so we can get the benefit of, of your entire statement. Okay, it's not much longer. I'll go as quickly as I can. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Um, I would say that the thing to understand here, the key point, is that the AIIB president's office is unusually powerful, even in the context of a multilateral organization. It's extremely top-down. And that office is a cocoon physically cut off, and it is dominated by senior Communist Party members. So this uh, uh, heel-clicking obedience is the way I would describe it at the president's office. It's valued more highly than any other virtue at the bank, including notably freedom of expression or thinking differently than other people do, uh, which is kind of ironic when you consider it's a multilateral organization. Um, I think that you have to realize that ex externally, over and over again, externally AIIB says that it's an apolitical independent organization. But honestly, internally, the atmosphere there in Beijing is anything but. It's political and it's CCP political. There's a big difference between those two. And that has helped to create a toxic culture inside of this organization. Now, when I first resigned last May, citing my concerns about the CCP's pronounced, profound, and pervasive influence in the everyday operating business of the bank, and its toxic impact on the culture. Um, Mr. Jin, the president, did not accept my resignation. He talked me out of it. And uh, the, I, I was kind of shocked that the bank did not deny and did not confirm my allegations or concerns about CCP influence. I was simply informed that the president's office did not like my raising the taboo CCP topic. After accepting my second resignation in June when I left in a hurry for Japan, the bank started attacking me personally. Journalists covering the news of my departure, some of whom I'd known a long time I joined the bank, before I joined the bank, they warned me that bank executives were trash-talking me off the record. And this was well before, of course, any bank investigation took place. Hundreds of pro-AIIB, pro-CCP bots on Twitter targeted me with insults, and I was accused of being an American agent of espionage, a white supremacist, a neo-colonialist, or part of some nefarious Canadian government plot to embarrass China. Which brings me to this. When I announced my departure from the bank, I did not ask the government of Canada to do anything. Um, period. I, I acted in an individual capacity out of what I considered to be ethical responsibility and also a patriotic duty, frankly. I... Uh, have cooperated, though. I have supported the review conducted by the Government of Canada uh, and uh, provided information to the Department of Finance in this regard. Uh, indeed, I note that several of the topics of the extended review mirror concerns that I raised with the Department of Finance on transparent governance, management competence, and proper professional culture at the bank. So finally, this point. When Mr. Xi uh, proposed the AIIB, he was a relatively new leader, still seen as a potential reformer, maybe somebody like Deng Xiaoping in 
1978. But now uh, we have a, Ma a neo-Maoist leader of China, a an authoritarian dictator uh, who, uh, well, look, after so much political interference, things look much different than they did that we all hoped that by placing this bet on a multilateral institution in China that we could have a window on Asia's development. Well, I think what we have now is a bank for China's influence where China gets ex the exclusive geopolitical credit for the lending of the bank. I want to give you as much time, but I actually do need to ask some questions. Go ahead. Um, so one th first thing I want to ask, you said not a single, not giving a single tangible benefit to Canada as a result of the involvement. Um, to the best of your knowledge, has any of the money that Canada has provided to the AIB, has that been uh, refunded back to Canada? Not that I know. And I don't know the details of that kind of a financial transaction. I did not take documents from the bank when I left AIB, uh, and I would have not have access to that information now. Are you are you familiar with the the PRC uh, 2017 national intelligence law? Um, n not by that name, no. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm aware of how business is done in China, but that's a well, general the, statement. The, the law obligates individuals, organizations, and institutions to assist the PRC security and intelligence services in carrying out a wide variety of intelligence work. So that would apply to all. Uh, Chinese citizens. So would that sort of mesh with your experience with what went on at the AIB? It's as a result of uh, the national intelligence law? Oh, definitely. It's a question of, you know, first loyalty. I, I, I believe that it's very clear in the bank that that would be the, 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 the responsibility of the 30 towards 40 percent of the staff who are, are Chinese nationals, many of whom uh, are, are, of course, CCP members. So as you reflect back on the comments you've made about the bank, its structure, the CCP talking points, et cetera, et cetera, would the fact that this law obligated individuals to behave in a certain way, uh, does that sort of, to excuse the phrase, square the circle for you on why this was going on? A short answer, please, Mr. Picard. I'm sorry? A short answer? Yeah, I, I think so, yes. I, I, I believe it's, what I saw, what I experienced is consistent with what you're, you're talking about. Thank you, Mr. Seaback. There's a, a range of different things that you've outlined for us in your opening statement in the previous round. I just wonder if you could provide us with a, a summary of the key allegations that you're, that you're making, because I have a sense, and, and based on previous media reports, of where you're coming from. But sure. In the testimony... ...understand the specifics of what you're alleging. Well, the specifics of what I'm With alleging... With respect to AIB. A I, I am alleging undue Chinese Communist Party influence in the everyday operation of the bank, where key positions in the bank, where decisions made in the bank on uh, discretionary spending or, you know, important projects that need uh, approval, you know, uh, who gets the, the nod on uh, budget projects. Uh, there's a whole latitude of everyday operating decisions inside of the bank which, uh, you know, either go to uh, the board or, or uh, go to through management for like a rubber stamp decision, uh, but are not decided by them. The president's office has a, a considerable degree of ability inside of the bank to make decisions. Most of what I got approved, keep in mind I ran the communications department, so that's my lens on the AIIB. Um, Almost anything that I was able to get approved for my department, you know, moving to the 10th floor, uh, opening a broadcast media studio, uh, uh, budget increases, uh, six new headcounts, uh, out-of-cycle headcounts, all of that was decided by the president's office, not by the management or by the board of the bank. So that is your, that's your main allegation? My main allegation is that has created uh, a toxic culture inside of the bank where people know that there's a subterranean network of relationships, like the cool kids in school, as it were. I was warned about the power of Chinese Communist Party members in league with each other as a favored class inside of the bank. They exercise, they have undue power and control inside of the bank, okay. which stifles free expression in the bank and sours the culture. When I joined the bank, I was told there was a crisis of bullying. And, in fact, there was an anti-bullying program that the bank was developing at that time, which we called responsible, uh, uh, Respectful Workplace, after I arrived. Um, those, the departments that were most 
concerned with bullying were the departments that were under Communist okay. Party members. Uh, my intent here is not to be combative with you, so please don't take the next question as that. No worries. Um, what is the specific evidence that you use to back your allegation? I mean, what to, to, uh, and I need you to be precise. What, what evidence would you point to? Is there anything concrete, yeah. uh, anything electronic, uh, physical, in terms of evidence that you have? Well, first of all, I left on my own steam for my own reasons. So I don't feel obliged to provide uh, that kind of uh, a detailed uh, document summary of what it is that I observed. I'm an eyewitness. I have, a, I have opinions. I saw certain things. I'm sharing certain things. I wasn't sworn in today, but I would swear. But if I had taken documents out of the bank, and people keep on asking me, where are the documents? Well, if I'd taken those documents out of the bank, I'd either be in a Chinese jail right now, or I'd be under serious litigation. So I, I can tell you openly and transparently everything I saw and experienced. Uh, I've given you some case study examples. I wrote a column in The Economist, uh, the, the many different interviews with different anecdotes. But if you're looking for a stack of documents marked confidential with the hammer and sickle on them, you know, you're not going to get them from me. Okay, so you've, you've seen certain things is what, I have you're, seen yeah. what you're saying. Sure, and well, Mr. Sheep, sure. Continue, go ahead. go ahead. Uh, well, um, first of all, um, the decision on which countries to go to by the bank president, um, the Central Asia Summit, which was adjacent to Xi Jinping being there. You know, last year, around the time that I left the bank, there was a, a decision about where the president would go and what the president would say. And to me, it was very clear there was a geopolitical piggyback uh, to foster Chinese interest. Now, these photographs weren't published. President Jin of the bank was meeting with uh, world leaders, uh, not with the flag of AIIB, but with the flag of the People's Republic of China. I prevented their publication internally at the bank because I felt it would not look good on a multilateral institution for its president to be seen meeting under the Chinese flag. Uh, you know, I, I, was ordered, or I was ordered to put on the website of a multilateral institution a c statement of condolence when Jiang Zemin, the Chinese uh, uh, previous Chinese leader died, um, our department pushed back. We thought that that would not be appropriate because, of course, Queen Elizabeth had just died. Mr. Picard, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You'll have an opportunity to expand on the answer in uh, in other rounds, I'm sure. I understand there was some reference to the uh, uh, AAIB's internal review, uh, and I'm, I'm wondering... Um, uh, Mr. Pickford, if uh, you could refu or re refer uh, or comment, pardon me, on on the fact that uh, the review, the internal review, found among others uh, that uh, that there was no evidence that the AI AIIB's decision making organs were unduly and improperly influenced. Yeah, the internal review was a despicable pack of lies. It was conducted in world record time of three weeks. It was not an independent review. It was conducted by a department whose senior leaders were already criticizing me on social media. The day I left the bank, the, the, the uh, AIIB said my allegations were baseless. Their report said my allegations were baseless. And I do not believe that they, they even seriously investigated the core allegations that I made at the time. Uh, the internal review also contains uh, factual uh, errors and a variety of other issues that I could, I could raise separately, but I want to be succinct here. Steve? Well, I mean, we do have some, some time. Uh, what, what kind of factual errors were, would, could you refer to as an example? Well, for example, the report said that I did not raise concerns about my security, but I raised concerns in writing uh, with the bank's uh, facilities and administrative, administration department and with the corporate secretary. And I, I did so in an email. When, when, when Canada expelled that Chinese diplomat uh, back, in the, back in the spring, I'm sorry, back in the spring, I'm just going to turn that off. Back in the spring, um, I, I, I sent an email to the, and the, this was, the president's office of the bank was copied on this. I said, do I have anything to worry about? Should I be concerned with my security? And uh, I got what I consider to be not a very reassuring reply back from the, the bank's uh, executive in charge of security, who just by sheer coincidence is a member of the Chinese Communist Party and well known to be so 
inside of the bank. I also, frankly, I contacted the, the Canadian embassy, and I said, do I have anything to worry about for my safety in light of the two Michaels? And I can't say that I got any kind of you know, reassurance from them either. So this made me wonder, um, you know, especially when, keep, keep in mind, I think committee members have to understand, AIIB, they knew of my concerns on the Chinese Communist Party, and they were aware of my plans to inform the government of Canada of my concern. They knew this for weeks. So I was concerned for my safety in that context because a lot of stuff was going down inside of the bank that didn't make sense to me, uh, and, and I found extremely unusual based on what had been going on um, with my own department. Uh, I could get into more detail if we have time for it. Okay. Um, you also referred to a uh, toxic culture within the organization and uh, one of the most toxic cultures imaginable, which is uh, quite the allegation. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Well, there have been employee surveys done uh, by, uh, is it Mercer that does the AR, uh, sorry, the HR uh, consulting reports for in large uh, complex organizations? It has identified persistently uh, problems, and the Canadian board member would know this, it, uh, problems with, with the staff morale and, and lack of, particularly, number one issue, I think, would be lack of employee regard for the leader, leadership competence of the bank executives. Uh, when I uh, first convened an internal uh, town hall meeting of the bank uh, back in um, uh, July of 2022. We called it Inspire Day. It was an internal uh, communications event. We used a certain technology where staff members, uh, the, the 500 staff members, could uh, answer polling questions and we'd see the results on the screen. And right there on the screen were the words toxic culture. So that clearly is evidence of it, and I provided that to the Department of Finance officials in one of the documents I sent them. Uh, and uh, can you confirm that the AAIB's review found that while it found that the, the culture was not toxic, made, ser made several recommendations uh, that would get at the issue of culture? Uh, they, they said that they would look at that. Yes, they made, but they, they also took aim at yours truly. I think they felt I was attacking the bank's reputation. So they attempted to undermine my reputation. Uh, with what I consider some uh, very uh, slimy or uh, uh, low ethics attacks. I mean, they, they uh, accused me of uh, having uh, disagreements with staff members. Of course, the people who I had disagreements with were uh, members of the Chinese Communist Party uh, who uh, were uh, championing the uh, three toxic members in my department who had been harassing and causing problems in, in the communications uh, function. Uh, that, that detail as well, I did provide to the Department of Finance officials during the review. The Department of Finance announced a halt to Canadian activity at the bank and a review of the bank, Canada's participation in the bank, uh, when you announced your resignation. Um, how many times have you met with the Government of Canada with respect to their review? I met with two officials in their Elgin Street office during the month of July for a total of 75 minutes. I think it was an hour 15 or so, maybe an hour and a half. And after that point, I emailed uh, a variety of documents or observations as I thought of things or received messages from staff still at AIIB uh, reporting things I thought they might find of interest. Okay, and have you met with them in person since that no. meeting? Okay. Uh, any other uh, contributions other than providing emails and that 75-minute meeting? No. Okay. Uh, do you know anything about the announcement on December 9th, a couple of days ago, from the Deputy Prime Minister announcing a, a further halt uh, to Canadian participation of the bank and an expansion of the review to include uh, the four rubrics of... Uh, investments, governance, management framework, and response uh, to your uh, resignation. Do you know anything about this extended review? I saw that, yes. I read it in detail. I shared it on, uh, on X. But they haven't contacted you about the extended review yet? No. Okay. Um, you know, in paragraph 13 of the AIIB's review of your resignation, they 
uh, took a shot at you, um, you know, talking about uh, your workplace behaviors and manager managerial responsibilities. Perhaps you'd like the opportunity now to respond uh, to what appears to be a, an attempt to um, to uh, smear your reputation. Hmm. And you're in front of a parliamentary committee, so you are you are your testimony is privileged. Uh, you cannot be sued in a court of law for it, so you are free to say what you want here. I mean, smear against me was that I had a history of uh, disputes with people in my department and that uh, I was not processing certain documents or dealing with systems in a timely way. Um, th those were among the issues. Um, they also said that I didn't show up at, at some key meetings or something. Um, so... Let me just review those with you briefly. Um, there was one meeting when I was on family. I had to run, my, my mother is in a cancer hospice here in Ottawa. So I had to fly home uh, to uh, see her. And I was on family leave. And I did not attend an interview with National Public Radio in Washington, D.C. that I had arranged for President Jin. But the interview took place and he successfully uh, communicated his story during that time. That to me speaks to the low character of the bank, that they would, they would do that. Uh, I'm also in the communications job. So in the comms job, you know, <laughs> there's all these media, all these NGO groups, all of these fires to put out. And believe me, in AIIB, there's never a dull moment uh, when it comes to issues to, to deal with. Uh, I should also point out that my, my department uh, massively increased its budget under my leadership. I got six new headcounts. I got approval to build a half-million-dollar media studio. So I might have been the last one to hand in my, my promotion request for my staff or my budget request, but everything got through, and everything was done by the deadline. Maybe, I, maybe my other DGs got theirs in first, but I, I, I guess I was busier than them. Uh, did, were there any other employees at the bank that uh, felt the same way you did? I know, well, I know that there are people who feel that, that way. At the bank? Right, right now, yeah, sure. They're other employees, not, you mean? Yeah, other employees, but they just haven't spoken up about it. Yes. Okay. I do know that. I, I, get, I get emails. There's a spirit of discussion. AIB employee alumni groups. I've been, I've been okay. blackballed from joining sure. that. I have another quick question. About nine months before you joined, uh, one of the senior people at the AIIB left the door open to lending money to Myanmar's military junta. Um, did any, uh, any sort of communications like that uh, take place uh, while you were at the bank? I don't recall anything dealing with Myanmar. I was asked to meetings to discuss Russian procurement. And there was a debate internally about whether or not there should be a meeting with Russian companies to discuss uh, giving them opportunities to bid on AIIB contracts. And I was asked in no uncertain terms to keep that hush-hush and to uh, ensure that uh, word of it never uh, got known in, uh, externally. That would be the closest uh, uh, such issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to back up a little bit to you accepting the job. But I know that there are times when uh, the government is asked to promote people's um, employment in multilateral agencies and banks. Right. Was this a government appointment, or did you apply for a job and get it? I applied for the job, and I got the job. Oh. I, apl I, I applied online, which was the first job I applied online for, for Well, congratula ever. sort of congratulations. <laughs> I'm not sure you want to hear that. Um, what did you know about the bank when you were joining it? I knew that it was designed to be a rival to the World Bank, or so I thought. I thought it was uh, China's way, because the legacy financial institutions, whatever their storied accomplishments are, they did not take into account the rising economic heft of China, uh, which from a Chinese point of view meant they should go and create their own vehicle for multilateralism and show the world uh, that they could, they could convene a multilateral institution that could meet the uh, same requirements of uh, multilateral finance as the Western-based MDBs, but to do so in an Asia-based way uh, consistent with China's geopolitical interests. So it interested you then in that way? Yeah, I mean, I worked, I worked here in Ottawa. Um, in the, I worked at, during the Mulroney government. I worked in the, uh, in, the, in the global affairs minister's office. 
Uh, I, I used to work in this building in 1982 for that person. Um, I, I, uh, I had for a year, I'd worked in six different countries, Singapore, Tokyo, Seoul, New York City. Excellent. So I felt qualified Good. for the job. Um, jumping uh, ahead to leaving the bank, uh, you said just a few minutes ago you left under your own steam, I think were your words, your own reasons rather. Uh, can you explain uh, about your leaving and, and what was the decision-making process and, and all of that? After the president's office became aware of my concerns on uh, CCP influence in the bank, everything from that office toward, <laughs> towards me changed. Um, the ombudsman of the bank... Uh, himself, I believe, a party member, was uh, undertaking an investigation of my department based on uh, complaints from three members of my department who did not subscribe to my leadership. I was trying to modernize the department, uh, bring, it, bring it into the modern age, but I had three people who uh, opposed me because they, uh, they wanted to keep doing things the way that they had been done. Were they members of the Communist Party of China? I don't think so. Okay. They were not no, but they knew that they, but they knew the power structure to, to go for. A question to Mr. Pickard is, is, uh, um, is there a role in, in this world for uh, a improved Asian infrastructure bank, given the fact uh, that uh, uh, there are so many countries uh, on the Asian continent uh, that to face an immense infrastructure uh, gap and, and, of course, where there is immense opportunity? It's... It's important for members to realize that most of AIIB's financing is co-financing with existing MDBs, uh, such as the World Bank and the uh, Asia Development Bank. Uh, there's, uh, so far, most of AIIB's projects are in the future. I think we have to ask ourselves as a country, support multilateralism, and do we want to finance development projects through a Chinese-dominated uh, multilateral or through a, a Western or Japanese-dominated multilateral, because those appear to be our current options. Well, a further question to that is, is uh, you know, and if I can turn it domestically, I mean, there's been a fair bit of deal, uh, criticism of our own infrastructure bank here in, in Canada and its governance, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, uh, and uh, in the way in which it's not meeting the uh, uh, stated goals, including, um, uh, well, so far, um, uh, real investments in in, uh, in taking on the infrastructure gap that we face in our own country, particularly in Indigenous and Northern communities. Uh, so um, while obviously uh, you've raised particular concerns, um, one may also uh, note that uh, uh, it's not as though Canada's infrastructure bank is an, is an incredible model uh, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, dealing with the or acting on its on its mandate. And I'll leave it there. I'm not sure if you have any comments to make on that, but, uh, um, you know, it's certainly some food for thought. We have a lot to learn from China when it comes to building infrastructure. There's no question about it. But they have a lot to learn from us in terms of respect for communities, listening to people affected, and talking about impact to the uh, countries where they're building infrastructure. And do, are we putting people on a, a debt treadmill, building debt traps that they cannot escape from? These are some things that are, are worthy of further conversation. It. There we go. Uh, we'll now go to Mr. Chong for five minutes. Mr. Oh, oh uh, Mr. Seaback, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. There you go. Um, Mr. Pickard, given your experience, um, as you say, with uh, CCP party members in the bank, uh, given what I just gave a brief excerpt of the 2017 National Intelligence Law, uh, do you think that uh, this bank is reformable at all to get under the, get out of the yoke of influence of the the CCP? I think Chinese Communist Party members, in a in a subterranean way, will always be the power network inside of this bank. Having done business in China since the year two thousand and one, um, I can tell you. Uh, this, this is probably, if, if there are no co Communist Party collaborations in this bank or no informal groupings, uh, it would be the only such organization in all of the PRC. 
uh, that that could be said of, and I don't believe that it's so. Uh, there may not be like an officially registered party committee or, or cadre in the bank, but I, th I believe that the operation and the, and the collaboration is very similar to such in a more informal way. I, I'm, I'm going to press you. I, I appreciate your answer, but do you think it can, can it be reformed uh, given the sort of vast influence you're describing of the, of the Chinese Communist Party within the bank itself and its influence over uh, yeah. Chinese citizens as yeah. a result of the national intelligence law? While they are all on their best behavior in Beijing right now at the bank, I would say that so long as we have the current geopolitical situation and so long as we have the Chinese Communist Party trying to work to undermine Western democracies and to have China replace the United States as the number one power, it is impossible for that to happen. Uh, I want to turn to the, to the bank's report, and um, I don't want to go to any specific uh, parts of it, but... Um, Given what you've described, again, as the influence of the Chinese Communist Party, the structure of the bank itself, which I'm sure you're familiar with, what would you say would be the possibilities that their own internal report uh, is going to be uh, fair, balanced, and fulsome? I would not have confidence in any report coming from that bank. The objectivity, the professionalism, the lack of independence... In my case, the lack of any independent report uh, produced from a, uh, a department with Chinese Communist Party officials and with senior executives criticizing me publicly while the report's being written, I mean, I would not trust that. I would not trust anything coming from them. And I don't think they have the resources anyway. It's very lean internally. They, they, there's not a lot of bandwidth there. It's, it's, it's uh, understaffed. And, and so to be clear, this, this report was... A internal report done by this wasn't external auditors that came in uh, to look at to look at and and sort of balance what uh, the bank is saying versus what you're saying. No. this was. Would you would it would you um, being in the PR business yourself? Yeah. Uh, would you uh, hazard uh, to say that uh, their internal investigation was more of an exercise in PR uh, than it was in fact finding? Well, yesterday the the Global Times accused me of hype and smears. Uh, so I, I feel like I have some familiarity with this. I, I, I feel like that's exactly what they've, they've done to me, uh, leveled various uh, allegations in a hatchet job report. That's, uh, what's the expression we should look for? Is it, was it a kangaroo court or is it a snow job? But they did not do an independent report. I refused to participate in that report. They gave me no access to my documents. To the member's earlier question, uh, you know, I, I couldn't have provided them because they wouldn't let me have them anyway. So, so wait a minute. In their own internal report that they wanted you to participate in, they wouldn't give you access to any documents to, as, as part of that investigation? They refused because I wanted access to the documents so that I could create a, a timeline or provide examples. And I was completely locked out and told that that was not going to happen. Thank you very much. And um, this, was, this was done by the Brazilian uh, legal counsel of the bank, Alberto Nino, um, who's, at whose home I was supposed to have dinner the, the weekend I left the bank, actually. I didn't show up for dinner, so he wrote the report saying I didn't show up at meetings.